So I'm just introducing today's uh, presenter. It's uh, Jean Franzon, uh, who is also on the faculty of this uh, OI Teleecho uh, program. And uh, Jean is pediatric orthopedic surgeon at uh, Namor Children's Hospital in uh, Wilmington, Delaware. And she's also an assistant professor of uh, orthopedics. And uh, Jean is already quite well established in the OI field, and uh, she's going to talk about uh, the upper extremity rotting today. So Jean. Terrific, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for this opportunity to give uh, this talk on certainly a challenging aspect of OI care and one that interests us uh, very much uh, and one that we feel uh, is very important. Uh, disclosures are shown here. Uh, we'll start with a recap of the goals of our orthopedic management of OI, and those being to maximize each patient's function for each of our patients to achieve their developmental milestones as close as possible to their peer group and to decrease deformity and fracture burden. And you'd cer I'd certainly be remiss without starting this talk by, of course, mentioning that the care of upper extremities, upper extremity surgery, fracture care, of course, does not happen within a bubble. Um, I feel very fortunate to have a large multidisciplinary team here. Um, and this is really one, one little aspect of uh, this team. Uh, the reason I include this picture here of uh, my partner, Dr. Cruz, and I uh, with one of our uh, four-year-olds with very severe OI um, is really to mention the collaborative decision-making and the collaborative nature of these type of reconstructive procedures. Um, as, a, as a group uh, with the family, we uh, came to a decision to operate on this very, very tiny humerus uh, in this little girl with very severe OI and actually a gap non-union there. Um, and really countless hours of ideas and discussion um, and that collaborative nature of this type of care um, is um, what I feel very fortunate to be part of. Uh, so I wanted to start with that. Um, again, um, all of this um, upper extremity management is really contingent on appropriate medical management. And when we're taking on these challenging cases, um, an OR team that's familiar with our OI patients including anesthesia, the pain team that runs um, our intra, um, our pain service uh, after surgery, the medical complex team for managing patients on the floor, and physical and occupational therapy play a really critical role. The outline of what we'll discuss today, uh, we'll start with the discussion of the importance of the upper extremities. We'll then talk about OI upper extremity fractures, discussion of course of humerus and forearm rotting, complications that arise um, and issues that arise and strategies to deal with those. And then we'll end with a little smattering of other challenging upper extremity topics uh, and we'll go through uh, each of those. Why are the upper extremities so important? Uh, well, for our OI patients, uh, they really are critical for daily self-care, for mobility, for completing schoolwork, for moving into the, the working world as a, as a young adult and um, you know, beyond, and uh, for many of our patients for wheelchair sports. This importance of the upper extremities um, has been very uh, nicely outlined by quite a bit of work from um, our colleagues at the Montreal uh, Shriners. And uh, this paper in 2015, I think really stated it so eloquently, um, commenting on teens with OI type three, often needing assistance for basic activities like transferring to a toilet or a tub or a car or for performing personal hygiene. And that issues with these um, functions were oftentimes because of limitations in upper extremity function. And this conclusion here that um, this, um, these observations really suggesting that um, further improvements in the functional status of those most severely affected by OI are truly contingent on advances in the clinical management of upper extremity issues. And I think that nicely frames why this is uh, such an important part of our management. And where have we stood historically with realignment and rotting of the upper extremities? I show this uh, landmark paper from 1959 uh, from the Shriners Hospital in Chicago. This is Sophia de Millar's initial description of their really at the time groundbreaking technique of realigning and rotting uh, severely deformed bones. And in this early series, uh, it's important to note that uh, the upper extremity was included. 
And for various reasons over uh, the decades to follow this paper, not at all centers, certainly not at some of the centers doing the most OI care, but at many centers around our country and around the world, uh, there was much more emphasis on the lower extremity and the upper extremity wasn't always given quite as much uh, attention. Uh, so I like to start with that historical uh, context. And moving on to uh, when we might consider realigning and rotting the upper extremity. I think it's very important to remember that the vast majority of fractures in the upper extremity for our OI patients are treated non-operatively and don't uh, need rotting either at that time or ever. Um, this is a two-year-old boy with mild OI, uh, sustained this uh, both bone fracture of the forearm, was treated non-operatively and went on uh, to heal just fine. Uh, again, in neonates and the very young children, uh, certainly not every fracture uh, necessitates an x-ray and uh, the treatment, um, certainly far from surgical management, uh, really managing uh, these early fractures with various soft wraps. And this applies even moving on through a lot of the younger uh, childhood years. This is one of our six-year-old um, patients uh, at the time uh, with uh, severe OI had had a number of fractures of this uh, left forearm, um, managed uh, very similarly uh, with soft wraps um, as, as the one shown here. And although he may very well go on uh, to require realigning and rotting of this uh, left forearm, it certainly isn't the first thing we jump to. And again, although the distal humerus, meaning the part of the humerus bone shown by this arrow down by the elbow, Although that can give us quite a bit trouble healing, uh, this is one of our eight-year-old patients who sustained this fracture, but she hadn't had a fracture in this uh, particular bone in quite a number of years. Uh, we were addressing other um, issues with the lower extremities. And as you can see here, this fracture did go on to make a good amount of callus and heal nicely. And again, the rotting isn't something that we need to jump, jump to um, with uh, a fracture um, that uh, happens like this. Uh, so when to rod? There's no minimum age. We certainly do not have a cutoff. Uh, the things we look for are progressive long bone deformity that is interfering with development or function, recurrent fractures, fractures that have healed with deformity or perhaps have not healed, and that would be what we consider a non-union, and function is an absolutely critical element to consider with the upper extremity. How are these fractures, how are these deformities interfering with this patient's ability to do what they need to do with their upper extremities? And that is critically important. Again, the bone quality should be optimized before doing this. And the goal of realigning and rotting is to achieve stability and alignment. This is a four-year-old boy who had had a number of fractures of his right upper extremity with progressive deformity of both the humerus and the forearm. And we did a realignment and intermedullary rotting of both the humerus and the forearm in the same setting. For the humerus, uh, this rod was inserted um, in what we call retrograde fashion from the elbow up to the shoulder. This is the male portion of a telescopic rod, but we didn't have room to use the um, additional female portion. And this threaded fixation, we feel, helps prevent migration or moving of that rod. And this is the forearm with very small wires um, that we were able to um, use uh, to stabilize the bones of the forearm. And uh, these are the x-rays from six weeks post-operatively, went on to heal nicely. And this arm has been uh, much more functional um, than it had been before when it was fracturing um, quite often. This is how we tend to immobilize our upper extremities following a procedure with a very lightweight long arm splint uh, or soft wrap and a uh, soft uh, swath around the body. This is a 12 year old boy. Um, again, this, this young man has more severe OI than, than the prior patient um, and was older at the time of this initial realignment and rotting, but the pro progressive deformity and fractures were interfering with his ability to use his right upper extremity uh, in a functional way. This realignment and intermedullary rotting of both the humerus and the forearm, uh, you can see uh, the canals were not large enough to use a telescopic rod or even part of one. These are very small wires. Um, we did not actually put one in the ulna um, after uh, doing the rotting of the uh, radius. Um, 
it was the uh, better part of valor to uh, stop for the day. And this, um, these small rods um, have gone on to actually give quite a bit of stability and uh, a more functional upper extremity. So there are different types of rods as we've encountered already in these few case examples. In the forearm for the radius and ulna, we tend to use um, what we call K wires or non-telescopic rods that are smooth rods that, that don't have threads on them. This is an example of the telescopic fascia duval rod for the humerus. You can see the threaded fixation in this part of the bone and in this part of the bone and then the telescopic feature with growth. And this was inserted through the shoulder. We call that antegrade rotting. This is the same type of rod, a fascia duval telescopic rod inserted in retrograde fashion through the elbow. This is a different humerus, um, but again, one in a patient with severe OI with a non-telescopic, non-threaded rod. And this is an example of a newer type of rod. This is not a telescopic rod, but it has threads on this end that again can help prevent migration. And this was inserted down through the shoulder in antegrade fashion. And speaking of antegrade uh, rotting of the humerus, um, I present this uh, series from our colleagues in Omaha and they very eloquently described uh, their technique of performing antegrade rotting of the humerus, describing 35 humeral segments. Uh, the fascia duval rod was used for the majority of patients, although like we had seen in some of these prior case examples, in five of those patients, only the male portion of the rod was used. And the revision rate was 34% with the mean time from the initial surgery to the revision of 35 months with the most common issues being migration or moving of the rod, failure due to a new fracture, and two patients went on to develop non-union. I'll now turn to two parallel series from Montreal, um, which very nicely described the functional outcome of both humeral and forearm rotting in children with OI. And I think these have already become and really will be landmark papers in our OI community. Uh, this uh, series looking at the humeral rotting, again, showed fascia duval rods used in the majority of cases, non-telescopic rods in 16 of the 35 cases, and both self-care and mobility scores increased by one year post-operatively, and that functional improvement was maintained here in this series um, at least seven years uh, after the surgery. Uh, two revisions for prominent hardware were reported, as well as two distal humerus non-unions. And this data was uh, paralleled um, by the Montreal forearm uh, series as well. Uh, again, looking at 22 forearms, both the self-care and mobility scores improved. This improvement was maintained and uh, there were um, consistent with, with all of our um, centers issues, um, most commonly in the forearm, the K wire or the rod in the ulna migrating proximally, meaning it comes out, um, out by the elbow and uh, a few non-unions as well. We looked back um, at our center at uh, our upper extremities and reported on both the humeri and the forearms just around the same time. And uh, the piece of data that we were able to add here was looking at the fracture rate before the rotting and after the rotting. And uh, this uh, was a dramatic difference with an average rate of almost one fracture per year preoperatively and about one-tenth of that uh, postoperatively. And our complication rate and issues were very similar to the other series. So what are these complications and issues that we encounter most frequently? For all of the segments, growth is a factor. Uh, fractures do happen. We haven't yet found a rod that uh, kids have, and adults haven't been able to figure out how to bend or break. Most specifically in the forearm, that rod in the ulna tends to back out by the elbow. And in the humerus, we'll talk about the radial nerve and ways that we can approach this uh, complex issue of a non-union in the distal humerus. This is an example of proximal ulna rod migration. Uh, this young man uh, left the OR with rods in both the radius and the ulna. We were happy. We were able to pass these rods in what we call closed fashion, where we were able to manipulate the forearm and not have a, a large approach or an open osteotomy. The three-week postoperative x-rays unfortunately demonstrated that the rod had moved this away. Uh, and for the non-surgeons in the group, uh, this uh, is not supposed to be here. 
Uh, the way we addressed this is um, by re-advancing the rod, we bent the tip, um, we exposed the elbow to provide additional tissue coverage uh, over this rod, and uh, fortunately it has uh, gone on to do quite well. Uh, but this is an issue in the OI community that we do face. Now moving on uh, to how we address uh, poor, the poor healing site in the distal humerus. Very much like the tibia, the distal humerus is a site that gives us quite a bit of difficulty healing. And uh, Dr. Esposito uh, and his team in Omaha um, really paves the way um, for a technique that we very frequently turn to um, as a strategy in our toolbox for the distal humerus. This is an example. This is a case report he published uh, back in 2013. This is a four-year-old boy uh, who had undergone realignment and rotting of the humerus. And here where I'm circling, you can see that uh, the bone hadn't healed there. And this young man had gone on to a non-union. This is despite using a, a bone stimulator in the post-operative period to try to encourage the healing. And the way uh, he addressed this uh, is by uh, revising the intramedullary rod and adding supplemental fixation with two plate and screw constructs to help uh, prevent this um, non-union at the distal humerus from having any rotational instability uh, and also supplemented uh, with biologic factors as well. Um, but this is a, a tool in our toolbox that we turn to frequently. This is an 18-year-old young woman uh, who presented to us after two prior surgeries on her right upper extremity. And this deformity seen here in her right humerus was limiting her in a number of ways. She couldn't reach her right arm to where it needed to be to do self-care or to do daily activities such as putting in earrings. Um, and as a photographer, it was very difficult for her to use her camera uh, and support it. We performed a realignment and intermedullary rotting of the right humerus. It's a little bit tough to see on this x-ray, but we did three osteotomies to straighten the bone. One here, one here, and one down further, and used this um, threaded non-telescopic rod. At four months after the procedure, uh, you can see here uh, better healing at the upper two osteotomies than at the distal one. Um, but was doing well, uh, and at this time was actually admitted for this um, severe basilar invagination that you can see here, and underwent a, a surgery with uh, halo traction and fusion. Um, this, um, these pictures show the improvement in the range of motion, even though this isn't the end of uh, the story of this arm. You can see in this upper picture here, able to raise her arm quite nicely. This is my favorite of the pictures because it shows she can now reach her ear to put in earrings and, and do self-care and these pictures showing the flexion and extension. Unfortunately, like I said, it wasn't quite the end of, of the tail. Um, after advancing ambulation following the BI surgery and returning home, uh, right at this site here, and then as shown by these arrows, she sustained a fracture through what we would consider to be a radiographic non-union, uh, a part of the bone that hadn't healed as well as the upper two parts. We address this um, by repairing the non-union, um, adding biologic factors, and also adding this plate and screw construct. And although you can see here that there are still signs that it hasn't fully healed on this side, even five months after the non-union repair, the clinical stability that the plate and screws have given have um, reduced or actually got rid of the, the pain in this extremity, improved uh, the strength, um, and really allowed her to get back to activities, um, including using her camera. This is another example of addressing a humerus non-union with a supplemental plate and screw construct. This is a 23-year-old young man with severe OI who had a long-standing non-union in this left humerus and had undergone a number of procedures uh, in the past and had issues with the radial nerve, which runs right by uh, this non-union site. We addressed it by um, doing a neur neurolysis of the radial nerve, which means clearing it of all the scar tissue, repairing the non-union. Um, we used this plate and screw construct seen here, and these are the x-rays two and a half months later. He's gone on um, to not have pain, and the radial nerve function has improved. Um, so this tool is something we turn to frequently. This is an example of a 14-year-old young man, uh, 11 years after uh, Fossier Duval rotting of the right humerus. So he did get quite a few number of years out of this uh, rod. It telescoped very nicely with growth. Unfortunately, his bone grew away from it, 
and he had a number of fractures uh, in this distal humerus uh, that were not healing very well. Um, we did an antegrade rotting because he was at the end of growth. We did not need the telescopic uh, feature. Uh, did an open osteotomy at this non-union site and um, really had a contour, the plate and screws uh, to match the bone and uh, fit under a very important structure. Um, this here um, shown by the arrow, that's the radial nerve and that tends to pass just where these distal humerus non-unions are. And if you can see the importance of seeing this nerve and protecting it um, during these uh, distal humerus procedures. Nine weeks post-operatively, he's uh, continuing to heal. Now, when we do multiple osteotomies in the humerus, um, it's important to note that not every osteotomy needs a plate and screws. This is a six-year-old boy had had many fractures in the left humerus, treated non-operatively thus far, was electively scheduled to undergo realignment and intermedullary rotting, but then sustained uh, this fracture that um, moves the surgery um, to be uh, a little bit more urgent. And during the, the procedure, the fracture provided us one osteotomy, but in order to insert the intramedullary nail, due to the deformity in this segment of bone, we did need another osteotomy. And what we found intraoperatively is that this fracture site, the osteotomy there was quite stable. It moved as, as one segment, it wasn't rotating on the rod, but the osteotomy we had to do further down was quite unstable. And that's where we put the supplemental plate and screws and this is him uh, two months after surgery, uh, healing nicely, and uh, eight months uh, after surgery, uh, again, continuing uh, to heal. You can see that he does have a little bit of residual varus um, or an outward bend in the, uh, in the distal humerus. Now, moving beyond um, the realignment and rotting of the humerus and forearm, what are the other topics that are so important for the upper extremity? One of them is protrusio. Now this is described much more in the OI literature as affecting the acetabulum, but we also have described it in the shoulder. In the acetabulum, you can see this is a normal hip in a 15-year-old girl without OI. And in this 15-year-old with severe OI, you can see the femoral head has been enveloped into the pelvis. That's what the protrusio refers to. This is an example of it on a CAT scan. This is a pelvis in an unaffected skeleton, and this is the pelvis with the protrusio where the uh, the whole pelvis has collapsed inward and the um, acetabulum has really enveloped that femoral head. This has been well described um, by the groups both in Montreal and at HSS, um, more common in the severe uh, patients, tends to develop over time. And we described it uh, in the shoulder as well where it's been much, much less discussed. Um, you can see this is a 17-year-old without OI, and in this 17-year-old age-matched patient, you can see the, the shoulder girdle, all these bones here, the clavicle and the shoulder girdle bones have really enveloped that humeral head. And the clinical implications of this are that it affects range of motion. It can certainly affect the ability to pass a rod down through the shoulder in antegrade fashion. And again, as we've discussed, the upper extremity motion is so important for so many activities um, that we're working on studying this um, and its clinical implications uh, at this time. We'd be remiss if we spoke about the upper extremity in OI without talking about olecranon fractures. Um, they are quite common. Uh, these are three of our patients who within about two month period all presented with a very similar fracture. This is a 14 year old boy and you can see this fracture here of the proximal ulna or the olecranon. And the reason that these fractures tend to displace is that the muscle here, the triceps, pulls this piece away from the rest of the ulna. So these do tend to displace. You can see this one had displaced quite significantly. And then this one, very similar fracture in a 12-year-old boy. We do tend to use what we call a tension bend tension band construct uh, to repair these two um, fracture fragments together um, with wires inserted and a band um, that holds, holds everything together. 
In this x-ray on the right here, you can see um, instead of using a wire tension band, we used a suture um, tension band, which doesn't show up on the uh, x-rays. And the reason for, for those tweaks is that this hardware does tend to be prominent. And oftentimes, uh, as in this young man, where you can see there's not a lot of padding on the back of the elbow, if this hardware is causing issues, we will usually remove it and replace it for an intermedullary screw, which is less prominent but avoids um, the fracture from happening again. Um, and this is uh, something that is, uh, is quite common. Dr. Smith uh, and his team uh, from Chicago um, have recently given us a very nice description of these Olecranon fractures. They looked at their 358 patients. About 8% of them had this type of fracture. It's mostly folks with mild uh, type 1 OI. We tend to find it oftentimes run in, runs in families. Two of the patients on the prior slide actually had fathers who had the exact same fracture when they were adolescents. Um, and what Dr. Smith um, really honed in on, others had touched on, um, but his data has made very apparent, is that risk of a contralateral fracture is quite high, over 40%. And that tends to happen over about the first five months uh, since uh, the initial fracture. So that's something that gives us helpful information for patients as well. And again, about um, almost a third of their patients had some type of discomfort from the hardware, that being the most common issue. Continuing on the theme of the, of the elbow, uh, radial head dislocation is something uh, that's important uh, to discuss with our OI population as well. You can see on uh, in this circle here, um, this is one of our more mild patients who does not have a radial head dislocation. This is the radial head here attached to the rest of the radius. This is the distal humerus and this radial head should communicate very nicely with the capitellum as it does here and as it does here you can see they're lined up. And if we contrast this to one of our patients with type 5 OI, this is the radial head here way out in a different zip code and same, same down here. And what are the clinical issues with this radial head dislocation phenomenon? Well, it does affect range of motion of the elbow and the forearm. There can be a prominent bump there, and it is a site of potential discomfort as well. Uh, the Montreal group um, described this um, looking at 489 uh, upper limb segments and did find uh, that the frequency of radial head malalignment was significantly higher as we see clinically in our type 5 OI patients with 86% of them having it. And again, there's uh, the other findings that we see with the type 5 OI patients, uh, namely calcification of the interosseous membrane, and that's specific for the, for the OI type 5 patients. And that we can remember was initially described in the, in the initial clinical description of type 5 OI. Uh, calcification of the interosseous membrane, the hyperplastic callus formation, anterior radial head dislocation, um, and those, those were all initially described uh, when type 5 OI was described and really clinically makes an important distinction in caring for the upper extremities of, of the type 5 OI patients. This is one of our um, patients with type 5 OI, a teenager. He did have a prior surgery uh, to the right elbow with an attempt to excise some of that radial um, head to, to give better, better motion, but that, that had not been successful. And that, that is um, another reason that I wanted to show this type of um, elbow in this type of case is that uh, although these are dramatic radial head dislocations, and the range of motion is significantly affected with our type 5 OI patients, um, we also do know that a surgery can make this a much worse problem um, with significant callus formation and um, potential pain afterwards as well. Um, so that is, uh, this is one of the things we do not have a great surgical uh, solution for. Um, this young man on his right elbow has what we call an arc of motion of 45 to 60 degrees of flexion. So his arm only moves about that much on the right side. And on the left side, he goes from 10 degrees to 25 degrees, only about 15 uh, degrees of motion there. Yet, despite those um, limitations in motion, there are ways that these patients uh, can do their activities of daily living. This is him putting in his contacts. This is putting on glasses. This is, I think, my favorite one. This is putting in the AirPods. Quite ingenious. 
Uh, and this is uh, one of the adaptive uh, devices that he uses for a lot of day-to-day -day activities. And the reason I bring this up is although we don't have a great surgical solution, um, that, that's not the, the end of the road in terms of care. And this is where occupational therapists and adaptive devices are absolutely uh, critical for improving and helping function. But for elbows with very limited motion and or pain and a radial head that's perhaps dislocated that are not type 5 OI patients, what, what is possible? Um, and, and this does need to be an individualized plan of care. But I wanted to end with this case um, because it's um, definitely moving beyond realignment and rotting, um, but brings up an, an important uh, intervention. Uh, this is an 11 year old girl with severe OI. Uh, the right humerus had had recurrent fractures and deformity, and uh, she underwent this realignment and intramedullary rotting. Uh, again, this is the male portion of the Fossier Duval telescopic rod. There are small threads up here helping hold it in place and um, went on to heal uh, the humerus nicely. Um, after this, there were a number of other clinical issues that came up, surgery for basilar invagination, uh, scoliosis surgery, really a number of other uh, issues. And during that time period, uh, the elbow had worsening range of motion, significant pain, and was really limiting her ability to, to do day-to-day -to -day functions. And at, by the time uh, we operated, the right elbow uh, motion had decreased to a maximum of 30 degrees flexion. So again, this was an elbow almost locked in place. And the, um, the treatment uh, here um, was a surgery to do what's called an interpositional arthroplasty, where essentially everything blocking that motion is removed and resected. Uh, the fibrous and scar tissue are removed uh, from the joint and then soft tissue is interposed there uh, to stabilize the joint and prevent bony um, contact infusion. That's called an interpositional arthroplasty. And even uh, three weeks after surgery, um, her motion was improving, um, functionally doing well. And the reason I like to end with this is with long-term follow-up, this is four years after surgery, you can see almost very close to full extension, full flexion, excellent supination, somewhat limited pronation, but really much improved range of motion with a long-term outcome. And uh, to end on a positive note, um, this young woman is an independent, um, lives independently, drives, is a is a graduate student um, and going on to uh, to great things. So again, this is highly individualized, um, but I wanted to end on it because um, again, it's a little bit pushing beyond the more standard realignment and rotting. And on that note, thank you very much uh, for your time and attention, and uh, look forward to our questions. <laughs>